Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Really, really important sale announcement coming up for Portrait Studio. The 1st of November to the 14th, Portrait Studio will be on sale up to 55% off. Right now it's currently at uh, $90. Um, so it's maybe steep for some of you. I know a lot of you are students and you're already struggling enough as it is, um, and I don't mean to keep it on the exact price for $90 for the entire year. And so that's why I host sales, but the sales are up to like three sales a year, and two of the biggest sales are coming up. Um, the fall sale, which comes hand in hand with the massive update coming up, and uh, the uh, holiday sale, which happens around Christmas for any one who wants to um, make some New Year's resolutions to study more. Today's class will be focused on form studies, so I hope I can show you how useful Portrait Studio is in that regard. Um, and one of the biggest updates coming up for Portrait Studio is the bulk um, batching, so you can combine multiple objects together as one object and rotate it as one object which is, um, those may seem like a very simple uh, thing to have in a, in a software. Um, it is very complicated to execute, especially if you have a one-man team. Um, Abu, our programmer extraordinaire, has figured it out and is um, bringing it to you because the one differentiating factor of Portrait Studio is that it's all uh, live. It's all um, real-time. Uh, it is not, uh, does not take rendering uh, time, there's no cooking time, um, or baking time, or whatever it's called. Um, it's all real time. Uh, light, camera, everything. Uh, so, if you don't know what Portrait Studio is, I'll be uploading some trailers soon describing its use. Uh, but it's a software uh, that helps you develop any kind of reference you need. Um, it has posable mannequins, it has form studies, it has environment. Uh, assets to use to create a, an entire scene outdoor or indoor with a character in it. It has a posable portrait, it has a movable camera, a light source that is adjustable, um, and a customizable portrait, a bust. Um, so the sale will happen uh, from the 1st of November to the, to the 14th, possibly all of November if I feel like, if I get lots of messages about people's pay cycles not matching with the Portrait Studio sale. If you are uh, benefiting from my classes, if everyone in this Reddit right now joined as $1, I would not have any more worries about medical bills. <laughs> um, I would not be scared. I'd be like, bring it on, and I would actually be just, anyway. Um, if everyone joined, you guys can support uh, uh, just with a $1 uh, tier. You guys can get educational material um, in exchange for a higher tier. Um, you guys can join as apprentices and get assignments, monthly challenges. Um, that are tailored to uh, production, uh, benefiting your portfolio. Uh, so we can move back and forth between illustration and complete render um, to uh, studies and basic fundamental ex um, uh, dissection. So if you guys want some, if you want to support, you have these lower tiers to support with, uh, but you still get something back, and then um, you have the higher tiers for educational material. And all of my time-lapse videos after hours that I don't put up, I put up uh, for initiates and apprentices. Uh, but there's a reason why I call the $1 tier the watchers. You guys really do watch over the community, and you prolong its longevity, and you support me directly. Um, which means and changes my life completely, which means the world to me. So thank you to everyone who's joined as a $1 patron so far. You guys are amazing. You guys heard the call and came forth. You guys are amazing for doing that and dealing with the checkout for Patreon. Um, I really, really appreciate the time you took to join us as watchers. Thank you so much. If you want your stuff submitted for Critique Hour, um, the stuff that I'm looking at today is from Critique Hour. I mean, for, from the Reddit, uh, for Critique Hour, um, and that is on the Reddit icon in my website. So go to isprac.com and click on the Reddit icon, and you can join there, submit your work. Everyone will take a look at it. There is currently an October design challenge. I mean, you don't have a lot of time left, but you can probably put, together, put something together, but eh. Um, it's due on Halloween, which is the 31st, which coincides with one of our streams at 5 p.m. Eastern on the 31st. Um, the ghoulish character design lineup will be due, and I'm just amazed by the quality of one of these submissions. Just fantastic work. I just cannot believe how wonderful this is. Exactly what I'm looking for. Classic a take on a classic character uh, with a twist, um, which is just fabulous. It looks like something out of a movie. And this is the kind of stuff that we host in our challenges, that I host, that I try to encourage portfolio stuff that'll possibly get you a job one day. 
Okay, let's get started on critique hour. So um, today I wanted to focus on a very uh, like important subject when it comes to being a student of mine, which is form studies. Um, form studies are the way for you to learn technical skill, actual skill, naked skill, let's call it. Naked skill is when you don't have color or subject or or, 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 or explosive decoration or anything like that in your illustration. It's just naked skill. And how do you show off naked 2D rendering skill? By uh, you do you do so by creating uh, subject-free objects, so basic shapes that encourage your uh, uh, just uh, mileage or increase your mileage with volume. And form studies, if you don't do form studies, it's a very it's a very boiled down way and very kind of like because we boiled it down, it's increased its complexity um, a way of doing a still life. Still lives are form studies. But again, there's color and there's edge and there's subject when it comes to still life. And that's an even bigger distra distraction for students because then they'll just draw symbols or they'll work too closely with symbols. We remove completely the ne necessity of the line, any kind of thing in your brain that might sabotage your depiction of this volume in space and we do so by giving it a shapelessness, a suspended shapelessness and we call those form studies. It can be organic with blobs, it can be geometric um, with cubes and other polygons um, but the most important thing about uh, form studies here is they advance your awareness of the core shadow, they keep you thinking about the light source and they help you uh, break free of the line. So what are the three points I just gave? And please write those back to me. So I'm going to be critiquing this, this, and then finally I will finish off by critiquing this and talk about what it is that's wrong with your representation here and how form studies could help you benefit um, more in your uh, photo reference pieces. So what's happening in this reference is this just a weird-ass little tangents. I mean, I don't know what the heck. What is that? And what is that? Why aren't you just going for it? <laughs> what is what is with this awkward lineup? It's it's bad for a drawing to do that because you've created a an X shape here, which creates this weird little spiraling shape this way and that way. And that, my friends, is a focal point. Uh, so it creates this weird awkward axis um, between two edges perfectly aligned and it drags our attention, it just makes us uncomfortable, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, so stop doing that and just go for it, go for the, the full, full thing. So let me see if I can just do that the other way around. That way I can just kill two birds with one stone. <coughs> So we got rid of that weirdness that was happening. Um, don't do that again. <laughs> it's just creepy. Um, and uh, let's talk about the lighting that you've done. So you, in a form study, are trying to prepare yourself for situations where you will be rendering um, environments, you'll be rendering characters. And what you don't want to do is uh, forget about the light environment. Um, and that means including the background and the ground. So the light environment is a combination of the background and the ground. And that means we're going to just give the background its own little value here to help us establish how much light really is happening. Because I refuse to believe the ground level is the same value as the background, which is a direct response to the light source. Um, the background can be open sky. It can be another wall in the distance. Always go for a neutral bright background value uh, when studying because it'll help you create opportunities to diffuse light sources and um, diffuse shadow, sorry, and explore bounce light. Um, and then we've got the objects themselves that you've done here. So 
the way you've executed this ca this cast shadow here is actually inaccurate because it's not distorted enough in the perspective into the distance. It doesn't feel flat on the surface. And you didn't do this because you didn't have a ground surface to help give your brain a chance to compute the requirement for this. And now that we know the ground level, which you already had before, is this brightness value, we have the background value here preparing us um, to, helping us prepare for bounce light and diffusion. We've diffused the cast shadow to match the brightness of the light environment. The sharpness of the cast shadows depicts a bright light environment. Sharp shadows means a bright light source. And, um, and we've respected the value of the ground on which the cast shadow is falling and the distance between the object and the cast shadow. Uh, the object receiving the cast shadow, there's a lot of space between this object and the ground, and that cast shadow doesn't have a lot of, of opportunity to stay dark. It doesn't have a chance um, because there's just too much bounce light coming down, diffusing it. Good blur on the cast shadow, though. It could be a little bit more blurred, but it's okay. And I'm going to diffuse these guys, too, even though this guy will be a lot more sharp because it's closer to the object casting it, less light is capable of peeking through. And your goal with a form study is to make it look as three-dimensional as possible. You haven't chosen the best light source. Um, when shadows move away from the light source, sorry, when shadows move away from the camera, it means the camera has the light source. That's really cheap uh, staging. Don't put the light source on the camera. That's crap. Because it, we're trying to create an environment that, it is, that is equivalent to what we see in the natural world. And we don't walk around with light sources over our heads. It's just an unnatural um, uh, grouping of shadows. It's an unnatural way for us to experience the objects around us. It's very, it's embedded in our brain to experience objects with the light coming from top down, which is sunlight. It's embedded in our brains to expect that, to want that. So that's why you study top down light all the time. No, we don't do one light source and then one day you're like, oh, I don't I feel like doing a side view light or like a side light cutting halfway across the face. You don't do dramatic lighting unless you're studying dramatic lighting. If you're studying volume, you keep the light source top down because you're preparing yourself again for natural environments. So what you have here is just, uh, it's not the best setup for you to experience core shadows. When light source is top down, when the light source is top down coming this way, you get to experience the wrapping of the cast shadow and the object and the light source are away from you. They're not a part of you. When you have the light source attached to the camera, everything is pointing towards you. Everything has accommodated your perspective, which isn't the best perspective to have if you want to appreciate a core shadow. This is easier for us to examine and cross-section a cast shadow, um, a core shadow, sorry. And here we're only seeing part of the core shadow. We're not really wrapping. It's not really the best way to experiment with um, uh, I mean, it's not the best perspective, it's not a horrible perspective, but it's not the best perspective to experiment with radial shading. So I always have light source coming from a top-down angle, direct top-down, symmetrical, um, not the 90-degree angle. Oh, no, no, it's always 45-degree angle or a little bit less than that. It's never directly top-down where the light source is directly above the character. Um, and it's also not always shining directly on the character where the core shadow is turned away from us and we're only seeing the bright side. It's always at an angle so that we get the best of everything. We get that nice core shadow that prepares you for what? Prepares you for portraits when we have that beard shadow across the face. So always make sure when you're doing form studies to experiment with a top-down light source. It can be top-down angled. Um, a little bit to the side, meaning some cast shadows can uh, can slightly shift that way. Uh, but if you're ever at a loss for which ca light source to use in a form study, always top down, uh, symmetrical, um, at 45 degree angles or similar degree. Okay, so now that we've taken care of that, your form studies are not looking very happy. Um, the way you flatten the form study here, it if it's not in perspective, if it's just a ball, if it's just a sphere, then it wouldn't really flatten along the horizon. It would just stay a sphere. Um, and if the light source is coming from an angle, the cast shadow is completely wrong as well still. So I'm just going to get rid of that. 
Even the defusion is not going to fix that issue. And then we've got the fact that there is no discernible kind of core shadow happening. So select inverse. Meaning that when we use radial shading, and this is one amazing thing to perfect in the lab environment of a form study is your radial shading. It means the world to have radial shading because it, it builds your instinct for where the core shadow is, is living. Um, dumbass Photoshop is not giving me, it's giving me some errors here. Okay, so we have a radial climb into the highlights where while our brush is shrinking, we bring in more paint. Okay, so that's the effect I'm going for. I'm shrinking my brush with open and closed square brackets and I'm raising my value up to respond to the light source. All right, and then I'm doing the exact same thing with the dark value. My opacity is low so that I could layer. Okay, and then we've got a lot of bounce light, so I'm grabbing the value down here and just diffusing. I'm making sure that the top half of the sphere is a different kind of world of values than the lower half of the sphere. And so what you have here is you have this top-down value and then you have some of the core shadows sitting on the top level, which is not accurate uh, because what we want to do is oops, see, separate the regions from each other. So there's the light neighborhood and there's the dark neighborhood. And we want to... Photoshop's being a cow. Okay, what is this? I don't know. Select inverse. <clears throat> Select inverse. Yep, that's the right one. Right. <laughs> We're just separating the top half of the object from the lower half. We've decided where the core shadow begins, where that region it starts to look away from the light source and where that region starts to move up. So we're identifying core shadows. Here it's a little bit more complicated because the light source is coming from above. And again, I'm selecting inverse and just treating it. So if you have a cylindrical object combined with a spherical object, treat them as separate objects from each other. Okay, an instant volume, look at that. Just instant volume and then there's that little bit, that little sliver arm of the, which I'm gonna smudge, of the cylinder. And sometimes it, it'll curl away from the light source so we do have that rim on the outside just as it curls away from the light source. And if you add in a sudden sheen, radial shading still works, you just climb faster. So you shrink your brush faster in order to achieve that sheen. Okay, and then we've got this shape here which is rendered as if the light source is pointing directly toward the center. The light source is pointing here as a laser but your cast shadow is underneath? So how does that work? That means the light is coming from above which means that all the upper halves of this object are getting light. Anything that looks away from the light is getting shadow. Again, if it's too complicated an object, break it down into its smaller pieces. You know where the core shadow is for a basic blob, and it's just four basic blobs com combined together. Okay, so like, why didn't you why didn't you break it down like that? You already did that, so it's already in your skill set, and it's already within your skill to ask the question, where is the light source? The difference between what happened here and what happened here is that your order got jumbled up in your thinking. You, you thought about the character, you thought about the nature of the, not the nature, you thought about the external kind of facade of the shape you were dealing with, and so you started outlining. Because that's what it looks like before. It just looks like basic outlining. You have values on the outside of the object, but you have a shadow underneath. So something in your brain decided to stop thinking in form and start thinking in lines. 
And that's how you end up producing unrealistic form. So my students, if you're with me, if you're in practice with me, um, I never let them do a ground. I, 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 I make sure they know what the heck they're doing when it comes to, so if you want to know what to do next, I make them know what to do with a suspended object. Don't worry about cast shadows. Cast shadows are an accessory. They are not going to change the nature, the interior nature of the form. All right. So draw a bunch of forms because you're clearly having issues marrying object with subject. And when you slightly adjust, so students go crazy when they slightly adjust a basic sphere into something a little bit more advanced, suddenly they freak out, everything becomes lines and they start outlining stuff. Um, because you guys are in danger of that, because you guys don't have the skill yet to just not freak out and just chill out for a second, you need to stop doing ground grounded forms and you need to stop um, uh, giving yourself even more hard balls. Um, your only responsibility is find the core shadow. All right, write that back to me. Find the core shadow is your only directive. All right, when you find the core shadow, in order to find it, in order to quantify it, um, you have to know where the light source is. If you know where the light source is, then you'll know the direction at which to uh, provide that core shadow on the object. And then you also have to ask the question, which object is it? Is it a volume filled uh, blob, which is excellent for studying organic or marrying geometric into organic? The reason why it's so important is because, um, or is it a geometric object with its own little edges and stuff? And I'll get to that in a second. The reason why it's so unbelievably important to sit down, shut up, and do your organic form studies is because organic form, this is it. This is the reason and you're gonna just have to deal with it and this is fact, all right? Organic form studies have radial shades, which are gradients. But God forbid you tell a student to provide a gradient because they're just gonna give you black to white. Because students are simple and and they're, they're just noobs. Okay, <laughs> I remember I say that with a lot of love in my heart. When I call you guys noobs, I say it with a lot of love. Um, uh, and you guys forget that gradients have to adjust to the volume. All right, so they, they're adjusting to the volume of the object. Things get lighter as they get higher or darker as they get lower. Gradients are part of the final render. So let's say you're done the entire painting. All you see are values that slowly shift from dark to light and that's what freaks students out. They're like, oh my god, the blending is so good and like I want to blend and then, then you guys start studying black to white and you forget that this volume, this black to white, which you've seen through your simple little scope is actually part of a greater volume that's being represented. The reason why it's in incredibly important to start your radial shading studies, all you artists who want to render well, do radial shading studies. Radial shading means the value radiates from the highest point or the lowest point, meaning there's a hot spot that's brightest or a hot spot that's darkest. And that everything else just radiates at, an, at a gradient that is respective to the volume that the hot spot is coming from or the hot spot is on, right? So it's radiating. And that's why I call it radial shading. Um, it's part of the end result, whereas blocking, let's say you blocked in a face, that's not part of the end result. Maybe in painterly art, but even then, you don't have raw brush strokes. That never really looks good. It looks cheap. You always have to have some kind of radial shading to help establish the necessary volume. Life isn't just a bunch of blocks. We have volume filled with flesh and skin and other organic patterns and surface curvature. Blocking is incredibly essential for your study regimen, absolutely, but it's not part of the end result. It's hidden because we start smudging. We get Isarak Smudge Brush from her website <laughs> and start smudging. Okay, there's a nice little plug there. You guys proud of me? Um, and that's what you gotta have to do. That's what you gotta have to do. <laughs> All right, please study your radial shades. Get your lasso, your freehand lasso, draw a random blob, ask where is my light source, and render that blob. Render a hundred more and you'll be good to go. All right. When it comes to applying geometry on your form studies, um, all right, you need to get rid of these random ass black blobs because they've thrown off your palette and they've thrown off your light environment. 
I know you think it's cool and edgy to put in big black blobs, but you've completely thrown off your light environment. Your light environment is the value of the background um, and how it is used to quantify the values used in the object. You're using some white spiked like You're using some crazy contrast here. And where is it coming from? It makes zero sense. Let me show you why it makes no sense. Because when we... Um, let me see. When we dim that brightness, then the light environment suddenly makes sense. Because we're saying there is no longer all this light coming out of nowhere. It's a pretty dark room with not much light exposure. Cast shadows might be a little bit um, less bright, uh, less sharp, but things can be this dark. Um, maybe it's just a dark room with not a lot of bounce light in it. And that's just what's happening, right? Maybe the darks are a little bit too dark. What you always want to do is make sure that your brightest brights and your darkest darks are not br too bright and too high a jump from your background. So if your entire palette that you use on the object is respective to the color of the background, how is the background not something you planned for? Okay, how, how, how do you do form studies and not plan for the background? So if we want to stick to your original values, and honestly, you're just a student. I don't have to honor these values, but let's just honor them. Let's just honor the choice you, ch you, you made. All right, let's try to work with the values you chose just to show you how we can fix it, because that's the point of before and after. We have to raise the background value way higher. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just keep fiddling around here, and I'm still not going to find a value that works. Because your black is too much of a jump away from the background, and your white, if we're matching it to white, and if we're matching it to black, the white is too much of a jump. So your contrast is horrid. Um, and it's not representing an object that is has a texture that is continuous throughout. Unless this was a panel that has its own illumination, it's like a monitor, there's really no reason for all this contrast. Contrast is what happens when edges are weak. All right, write that back to me. Um, and it's weird in this particular situation where everything looks so muddy is because your ed your edges aren't even that weak. So I'm not really sure what you did here. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna try to I'm gonna try to adjust the light to this object here. Just try to make sense of the values you chose. All right. There's going to just need to be a lot of diffusion. And then select inverse. And I'm just going to diffuse most of your shadows using light and layer. I'm just using a mid-tone here. All right. I actually want to do this a little more manually. I'm going to get this little dude here and you see how this curves it works like a little reflector it starts reflecting this surface right here which is getting a ton of light so you have this edge this part of the cube actually looking forward and getting way more light than this part and this part is doing the exact same thing it's directly facing a reflector pointing up and you haven't diffused it and that's bounce light that's why I say there's always going to be bounce light. Things There is always going to be bounce light, period. Write that back. There will always be some kind of diffusion in the traveling of light. And then you've got this shadow on this pretty flat surface. You've got all this shadow, which makes absolutely no sense. It means that you're still somehow outlining. Whenever you have shadow where light is supposed to be, the source of that, theoretically, um, and most likely just actually, um, is line dependency. You're putting shadows where they don't belong so you, cre you create this like like this false sense of security in that you have definition, this false definition. And that is a telltale sign of line dependence and symbol dependence. So what I'm doing here is I'm blocking in all the major areas that look up at the light. Yeah, the light is directly top down and that's fine. We just need to make sure we're diffusing and representing the presence of that light. 
And then you have the, these values that I choose here on the top half are respective to what you whatever you assigned. So this really shiny pipe. And unless it's really reflective, which you're not rendering it as such, it wouldn't really have that much shadow in the shadows. And this here is too dark. So the only time we get a dark is when we get a pocket. So something like this here, completely rejecting the light source. If we drew an arrow on every surface, which of these arrows would look away from the light source the most? And that would be the arrow coming out of this little pocket here. So I could leave that dark, but if I were to draw that an arrow here, it really isn't as displaced as one that is t directly looking away on the far half. So that means I am illuminating this. It's still going to stay a core shadow but it's not going to be ridiculously dark outside of its realm. I'm going to bring in a darken on the midtone, and I'm just going to get rid of the extra highlight you have everywhere. So if you think in these arrows, if you think in arrows, you won't ever feel lost as to you know what value to assign to which surface. I'm just blocking in the majority of these. This is more of a transition gradient because the outside rim, there's no edge, there's no cut. So that means if it's a slide, the value is a perfect gradient. So it means that's the same thing over here. I'm just going to use my smudge brush. Which you can get from my smudge. <laughs> okay. okay. And if there is an edge, uh, I'm just going to smooth it out. If there is an edge, it develops later on. And if the light is coming directly top down, that this little thing here, and I moved it a little bit, this little cast shadow comes here. That means that we get some cast shadow of this little, this little dude like on top of the object, just like this. Like we get some of this dude's little nose here, the little beak also will cast a shadow. So you've cast the shadow that way meaning that the light source is coming this way, and if that was the case, we would not have a cast shadow on this surface. Okay, um, so we're, we've got a lot of discrepancies. We've got a lot of stuff that makes no sense. And again, I'd rather you make that beautiful mistake where you're gonna learn on a, on a la in the lab environment of a form study than make that mistake on a masterpiece that you're being paid to complete. Okay, and it's just, you know, it's just no-brainer study. You don't have to tell a story. You don't have to draw a character. You don't have to move an audience. It's just rendering for the sake of learning your naked skill. It has nothing to do with your personality and who you are as a human being. It's just simple, basic exercise. It's like going to the gym. Whatever outline is happening on the outside rim of the object, that's what we represent on the interior. So that... Anytime we have an organic object, we have a gradient that is represented there. And eventually, the contrast will start making sense. But then quickly, you turn this gradient into a point, into an edge. And I think you're choosing form studies that are a little bit too complicated for you right now. The light is coming from this general half of the painting, which we're going to talk about when we look at this. And that means that it's no longer perfectly top down. So that means the half, this half of this leg gets a little bit more light. And it means that there's going to be a cast shadow of this entire object on the leg, which I don't think you have. <clears throat> and it still feels too dark. It still feels really muddy. And it, you're spiking so high in your reflecting values that the highlights and you're not representing none of it uh, on, the, um, on the values that you choose for the shadows. And I'm just creating this transition. So I'm going to thin out this cast shadow here, just so that we're finding a middle ground between this cast shadow that you have here on the far side and this one. And cast shadows that fall on objects follow. See how I curve this cast shadow? It follows the, the curvature of the object on which it falls. So I'm trying to represent that here. And this entire area is curved, so that means a gradient falls right here and I'm using my smudge brush on a really really low pen pressure and really low strength 
on the on the setting of the brush and my pen pressure on my tablet is said to be a little bit less sensitive so there's more range higher sensitivity the bigger the brush size you get instantly because it's sensitive so it's going to get like a read right away the less sensitivity the more work you have to do and so i'm just smudging this out to help create the cylinder and that's a big big old daddy o like the biggest shape to study right now it's like it's like so hot right now <laughs> okay the cylinder is the mother of all shapes when it comes to converting geometries into organic objects it there we don't have blobs everywhere on a human body we have cylinders everywhere and so if you don't know how to assign a core shadow to a cylinder um, you're pretty much not studying the thing that makes humans look like humans when we render them so when it comes to figure studies or the face or the nose there's cylinders everywhere and if you're not picking up on when instinctively on when a cylinder is happening in a form study, um, that's when your art sucks. All right, that's when you suck at rendering because you're you're not bringing out the basic stuff that's required. You know what? This whole image is just really small. It's driving me crazy. All right, there we go. No, it's that's still horrible. Um. 15. Son of a bitch. I'll, I'll just do it on a new layer. All right, and then cylinders, the beautiful thing about them is radial shading still works on them. And I'm just brush stroke number one, number two, shrinking my brush as I climb up, maintaining that cast shadow. Maintaining this core shadow and just cleaning on the outside. So it's always a hack and slash when I'm when I'm critiquing. I wish that I you know have perfectly lassoed and perfectly clean presentation when it comes to these. I wish I could work on these and keep breaking them down, um, but uh, I'm doing the best that I can to sculpt it right now. There's also this little portion right here the light is coming in at an angle so that means this upper half this half of the object is getting more light and again more blending so one of the assignments I assigned my apprentices a while back was an open room with multiple windows and a distorted organic shape inside that room and it was just really, really, it was a hardball. Um, and the reason why we have to give ourselves studies like these is because you're never going, it's never gonna get as complicated as that. And if you can break down a form study that looks like that, you can break anything down, especially a simple head in space. All of my students get assigned form studies like this. There's no student that books with me that would ever escape form studies. Um, so that's just for future reference for anyone interested in booking with me. You're never going to escape them. There's never going to be a quick fix to all your rendering woes. There's never going to be that. You always have to do form studies. There's a little bit of diffusion there that I'm trying to figure out. I think it just gets diffused like that. Because the cylinder is kind of like morphed into... And just look at this. You find the major core shadows for all the major geometric origin shapes. So you got this big square, we figured it out. We got the this this thigh here, we figured that out. We know every single um, cylinder needs gradients and we've applied those. So we find the bigger objects, the smaller objects are just smaller form studies. That's problem solving. Art is problem solving. Write that back to me. It's just mathematics. I know you guys hate that term, but that's really what it is. It's just basic uh, quantities and measurement and direction and approximation and that's it. Nobody actually has a camera that comes in and adjusts whether or not or some kind of viewfinder or some kind of detection device that measures whether or not your core shadows are in place. As long as they have there it is an accurate general estimation you know in regards to the light source it's going to look right. All the pros say this. They say there's no such thing as bad lighting if it looks right. 
All right, so that means as long as you have the general behavior of the object, which is if it was a cylinder, it has a gradient. If it's a cube, it has edges. And as long as uh, you, know, you have a cast shadow in the general direction of the light source and core shadows in the direction of the general direction of the light source, you're really not going to draw something that looks terrible. So your, crap, your art will look like crap and it'll look like it's sucking if you don't know how to render a cylinder, basically. But also you have that saving grace, that silver lining, where it doesn't have to be absolutely scientifically perfect. In fact, that looks too sterile and not a lot of people really like that look. The, the photorealism look. Okay, so you see there is a there is a nice little um, simplicity to the rules. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be generally accurate. I feel like this cast shadow should now move in this direction. I feel like that would make it look better. <coughs> Okay, so imagine this weird ass little shape one day will become a basic character sitting down or doing something. That's so much more simple, and you have endless amount of references to help you with these kinds of situations. And so, if we were to take this, what we've studied here today, and I'm just gonna show you how beautiful diffusion is. Just look at what how things look instantly right when we diffuse. I'm just using light and I'm getting rid of most of the cast shadows. Did we really need all that black on the far side? It's still reading a shadow. But did we really need that? And then if we lighten the background now, I lost my fucking lasso. Um, let's see if 10 does anything. Light in the background now, things should look so much better and read so much better. Cool shape though. Deselect. Deselect. Okay. All right. It makes sense. We have all this diffusion, we have these light spikes, and it looks realistic. And all you got to do is just cast that appropriate shadow moving away. And that would just do a little thing like that. Again, look at this. It's, it's, not, it's not even a perfect cast shadow, but it's going to work like as much as we need it to. And the object looks three-dimensional. Ignore this mess. Okay. So the problem with this piece is that this, okay, let's, let's do something. Let's get the basic elliptical marquee tool and try to shape out her head. And based off the averages I see, I'm just going to render the sphere of her head and see if you did that in yours. This is how I know if this was my student this is how I'd know how many form studies they've done. I'm just getting the basic average by using the eyedropper. I'm kind of not doing a perfect job of it. I should have probably started off dark to light. All right, so there's a very, very obvious three-dimensional shape here. And it's a very obvious direction in the light source. If it's not obvious to you, that means you have, you're a beginner. You haven't studied enough forms so that you could build an instinct to know where these are. Okay, so that's the general average. There's even brighter points. There's brighter points on the nose because the nose is oily. There's brighter points on the cheek, just different like oily points. Okay, so we have a very obvious gradient. In yours, you put a core shadow on the on the wrong side of the nose. Okay, why? Why? Because at one point in your life you drew noses like this. That's why. Okay, and that's 
that's exactly why there's a line to, there's an uh, an anxiety that happens and in order for you to get the read you think you need you throw in core shadows where they don't belong and outlining with look how you outline the mouth the mouth is a cylinder but you outlined it you need light on this half and boys and girls this is why we do form studies so we don't make mistakes like this that kill our art right you're killing your art by not doing form studies and look at that instantaneous change in the delivery before after two completely different artists but very very minimal changes because the principle behind it which is appreciate the volume the principle behind it is is so a massive like it's so massive finding the right core shadow is such a massive thing all I had to do was make the most simple change and it changed everything and for those who don't think there wasn't much of a change just keep up all right if you think this is not a big change reassess what you think is quality in a painting or maybe you are yourself don't have the lens yet to appreciate the difference between this and this two completely different uh, paintings now you don't have to copy the reference perfectly but if you can copy down the volume and I exaggerated the highlights it's not exact and these photographs are altered a lot and diffused a lot because the simple the change is so simple but it's such a big change because the fundamental behind it is massive <laughs> one count of art slaughter yeah so can anyone repeat to me the bullet points from today's critique hour? What are some of the more important, essential uh, topics covered today? What are um, fundamentals we covered today and why are they so important? I like to do these form studies every once in a while just so that we can remember that we're all hum humble us. It'll humble us. It humbles, form studies humble you because they remind you the basics will haunt you forever. There's, just because they're basics doesn't mean they're simple. They are forever complicated because they are the most elusive little fundamentals that kill your art when you don't have them. They're like, you know, you take them for granted the way you take your circulatory system for granted or the fine-tuned uh, mechanics in your heart, the slightest little tear in your heart and you're fucked. Um, that's the same exact thing. It's fundamental to have an awareness for where the core shadows are, just like it is fundamental for your function as a human being to have a functional heart. It's basic, it's very simple, but it is horrifying when it doesn't work properly, and it makes the biggest difference when the slightest little adjustment is made. Okay. Um, the absent uh, of form studies is murder. It's night and day. The after is a big difference because it shows the 3D form. Exactly. Um, environment influences subject. Subject influences environment. Uh, light environment is the combination of the background and the ground. Um, oh, thank you, Ruan. I appreciate you, too. <laughs> That's so sweet. Um, uh, what else, you guys? What else? What else? Throw them at me. What are some basics we covered today? There's really no point in these classes if y'all ain't writing things down. <clears throat> form study uh, equals 100% focus on light and mass with all distractions removed. It's not a beginner, weird, boring looking, oh, it's taking away my personality type thing. No, it is the most honorable thing to do as a student is to break down the object, humble yourself, not entertain yourself. It is so honorable to just appreciate the three-dimensional science is like the science of what makes something look three-dimensional when we look at it at uh, just with the naked eye why is it three-dimensional and, and my my channel is covered with that shit so if you're ever confused about core shadows you can literally literally start with any video even though I made a how to uh, like confuse where to start start here playlist um, you can literally start with any video because that's how uh, dedicated I am to these basics that they will always be mentioned 
because that's how important it is to have your heart function. Basics and fundamentals and volume and light on form, edges and radial shading and all the stuff that makes a painting work is the heart of painting well. Only responsibility is core shadows because out of the responsibility that is core shadows, all other fundamentals stem. Where's the light source? Where is the, uh, what is the time of day? How intense is the light source? What is the object? So the core shadow is at the center of all these questions. <clears throat> Treat combined objects as separate objects. Exactly. So it'll help remove the complexity and not freak you out and make you start outlining. Because that, you will always be in danger of outlining. Basics are freaking important. <laughs> form studies are love. Form studies are life. Thank you, David. What else, you guys? Don't put the light source on the camera because it's unnatural. Excellent. I'm still going through that basic playlist. You'll get through it. Um, even if you rewatch one thing, something will click. The beauty of it, you guys, and I have some good news is your brain will do the rest. Just do enough studies, your, your brain will figure the rest out. Your brain will automate the rest um, because it'll, it'll not be able to unsee the necessity of the core shadow. It's not, you don't have to actively hack away at it every time like you're a robot that, or a fish that forgot. It, it, I, mean, I mean, a fish is a bad example, but if you, because fish do remember, they can do tricks, by the way. <laughs> Goldfish can do tricks. <laughs> a little tidbit of information there. Um, okay, so it's not a robot that keeps resetting its, its, its memory every time. Your brain has memory in it and has muscle memory in it. It has instinct and it, and it has a lot of unconscious or subconscious uh, mechanics. And uh, it, it's not going to let you just wander aimlessly after every study. It's going to retain information that the... the, the, the measurement at which it retains like the actual amount it retains after each study is up to you are you writing things down in written way are you uh, uh, interacting with your information through writing are you interacting through in, through to your with your information through visual aid so are you looking at befores and afters are you repeatedly going back and forth is it a large quantity of studies these three things help corner in your information are you rewatching my videos and liking and subscribing <laughs> I can't say that without laughing my ass off. Ow, it hurts to laugh. Um, so uh, you have to corner yourself. You have to corner the information in, and you have to not allow yourself um, to forget this information, okay? Fish do tricks, yeah. <laughs> Make sure your brightest bright and darkest dark are not too high and jump from your background. Excellent. Um, now I want to be active, join the streams, and contribute to the Reddit community. I'm motivated. You're th thank you. I'm so happy that the, the channels helped you, and I, I really encourage you guys. It's just so that your art looks better, so that a commissioner sees skill and pays you more. Um, and it's just going to make stuff look real, and it's cool when the thing you imagine in your head has a light source on it and it looks realistic. That's how you make things look real. Uh, characters that are all fantastical suddenly have their own world because you, you respect your characters and making them realistic and have volume. Like, subscribe, and obey. <laughs> so if you guys like today's class and you want to give back to the community, you can always join as watchers on the um, on Patreon. If you feel like going through the checkout Patreon, if you feel like doing that, if everyone here today joined as a $1 patron, um, I really would never need to announce um, Patreon ever again. Like I probably just need to announce it for the next six months, and after that I'd be set. Um, but if you guys want to support me, you want to support what I do, you want to support the longevity of the channel, you can join me on Patreon. It's just a dollar a month if everyone joined and we all teamed up. Um, it would really help me. It would really help support the channel and um, curb a lot of the difficulties at the moment. Um, especially because YouTube doesn't seem to want to send you guys notifications. Um, it doesn't want to... Uh, recommend my videos to anyone maybe because they're too long and it pays me like pennies um, uh, for uh, with ad revenue because it's just not worth putting ads on an hour-long class and I don't want to shorten my classes and I don't want to change the way I work um, so if you guys want to help make that difference um, you can support me on patreon with any of the lower tiers it doesn't have to be a lot 
Um, if you want to submit your work for Critique Hour, go to isterback.com and click on the Reddit icon here. That's where I get stuff to critique. That's where I get content for these videos. Um, your art is what makes these videos possible. So if you go to Reddit and join, you can. It's not loading. Um, this is where I, I pin challenges at the top. So you guys have a really exciting holiday challenge coming up. Um, you guys have a really, really cool sorcerer, uh, like holiday themed, so Christmas themed, but not classical Christmas. Um, uh, and I'll announce it during Halloween. Um, not classical Christmas stuff, so I'm moving away from that classical stuff. I don't want to repeat or rehashing of pre-existing uh, symbols for the season, but new and recreated symbols or like new takes on it, like bioluminescence instead of Christmas lights, stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's wintry, it's tundra, it's exciting, it's an action scene, it's a wizard, it's also Santa Claus, um, it's going to have a magical element in it, it's going to have a glowing element in it, it's going to have texture requirements the way I did with the elemental design. Um, so it's going to be really cool. I haven't sent out the uh, brief for that, so don't try starting it, but that's upcoming uh, for the challenges and it'll all be pinned at the top of the community. And Portrait Studio will be on sale at the start of November. Uh, so that whole Cyber Monday holiday stuff starts very, very soon. If you're interested in Portrait Studio, if you want to recommend it to a friend, there's all kinds of information on it on my website. I mean, on my YouTube page. Um, and, uh, oh, I, I don't know where the playlists are, but you guys can find all kinds of information on Portrait Studio on my front page. Right here, right at the top, Portrait Studio, how to use it, how I use Portrait Studio, what it is. All my brushes and Portia Studio is available on my store. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm sorry about my absence on uh, Thursday last. I had to go to Canada. Uh, but this Thursday, the 24th, I'll see you guys again at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you everyone for coming. And upload some stuff on Reddit. I'm not seeing a lot of stuff uploaded ever since Google Plus shut down. When we had Google Plus, there was like 30 posts a day. I never was, I, I never saw the previous days when I was scrolling. It was always new stuff. So don't be shy. If you used to be on Google Plus, there's no reason for you not to post on Reddit. It's really easy to use. It's not as complicated as you imagine it. I know that it seems to be like a million tools, but it's so simple to use. And a simple YouTube search, how to post something on Reddit, it will help you just uh, make your first post. Everyone is posting here from challenges to studies to illustrations. Um, remember, no anime is welcome. Um, just because it's style based and it's difficult to critique because it's cookie cutter and it's template and it's hard to critique something that has already been established as a canon. And that's it. Thank you everyone for coming. I'll see you guys on Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Bye guys.